platform or YouTube. So here only the faculties will be there. Okay, sir, and we have uh, done live on YouTube also. With all your permission, I am starting this session. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone present here. I am Faraz from Clarnet. Clarnet is very proud to be a part of this session as a digital partner. Clarnet is India's digital live CME platform where doctors generate medical content. With all of you, I am presenting a short video on Clarnet. Uh, thank you so much, all doctors for watching the video. And you all are requested to visit our website that is www.clarnet.com, where doctors generate medical content. And we have MedWiki service also, where doctors uh, you can also watch that MedWiki services, and where you can watch lots of live sessions conducted by expert doctors across the globe. And by taking not much time, I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Prashant Karya, sir, Honorable Secretary NNF Gujarat. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you. Thank you so much. So, on behalf of NNF Gujarat, I, Dr. Prashant Karya, the Secretary of NNF Gujarat, welcome one and all. Uh, NNF Neonatal Patshala is a presidential action plan of Dr. Sandeep Trivedi during the year 2022. And today is going to be the last session of a year 2022. Uh, today, uh, I request our President, Dr. Sandeep Trivedi, to address the gathering as a President of NNF Gujarat for the last time. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. I, I welcome uh, today's moderator, Dr. Chandan, and uh, today's expert, Dr. Lakshmi, and, Dr. and also Dr. Bhargav, who is the present the case. This is the very popular program uh, in pediatrics and also in the neonatologist to learn uh, so many things from this platform. And also PG student, uh, PG student are very helpful this program, and this is a successful program. We hope this program neonatal part cell is continuous during uh, 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 further, uh, 2023. Thank you, Prashant, and I welcome to all. Thank you very much. So, thank you so much. So, without taking much of a time, today, Dr. Bhargav Vishwanullah, who is a third-year resident in uh, Bhavnagar Medical College, is going to present a case. The case has been guided by Dr. Chandan Narwani, who is the assistant professor in the same medical college, and he is going to present the case. We do have two experts with us. First is Dr. V. Lakshmi. She uh, has done his, her fellowship in neonatology uh, and she is at present HOD and consultant neonatologist at Dr. Mehta's Multi Speciality Hospital, Chennai, India. She was a secretary of uh, NNF in 2020 21. Uh, she is a national NRP faculty and teaching faculty. Uh, so, without taking much of a time, I welcome ma'am, Dr. V. Lakshmi. Ma we do have Dr. Somashri Ray with us. She is presently the assistant professor in neonatology in Calcutta Medical College. And she has done her uh, DM neonatology from the PGM of Chandigarh and MRCPCH from the UK. So I welcome Dr. Somashri Ray also. Thank you. Yeah. So, Bhargav, uh, we will start with the case presentation. You can start with the screen sharing, and both the experts will be there to uh, take your uh, case. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Our advisor, Dr. Uh, Som Shekhar, sir, is having one more meeting, and Dr. Ashish Mehta, sir, and Dr. Yogesh Parikh is our project in charge. Thank you. Yes, Bhargav, screen is visible, full. You can start. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Bhargav, third year resident, Sarti Hospital, Donor Medical College, Bhargav. Now, today I am going to uh, discuss a uh, case regarding preterm patient. Uh, under the mentorship of Dr. Chandan Narwani, assistant. Can I start, sir? Can I start, ma'am? Yes, please. Uh, coming to the case details, my patient, my informant is a 
for patient details are pay, uh, baby of Josna Ben Rahul by a 20 year old uh, female newborn born out of non consanguineous marriage, born, born out of a mother residing at Botar, and the child was born on uh, 22nd November uh, 2020. And the mother's LMP was on uh, 15th April 2022 uh, and uh, expected delivery on uh, 22nd January 2023. And uh, the newborn was born at uh, 32 weeks of gestation, uh, has been examined on 20th day of life. Uh, coming to the antenatal history, uh, mother's, mother's age is 22 years and uh, she is 57 kgs weight, had a regular menstrual cycle and uh, married at 20 years of age. And uh, it is a spontaneous concern uh, and it is a primary gravida and uh, pregnancy was diagnosed at uh, three months in age. And, uh, it has been registered and uh, five antenatal visit has been taken at that and uh, patient has took a regular DT vaccination, two vaccine doses have been completed, mother blood group is uh, B positive. And uh, coming to the antenatal history, uh, trimester wise, uh, first trimester, she has no any significant history, no history of any rash, no history of or radiation exposure in first trimester and uh, dating USG was done. And uh, coming in trimester, uh, she has started IFS supplementation and she felt uh, quickening at her uh, fifth month of gestation. No any uh, other in associated pregnancy illnesses like uh, pregnancy induced hypertension, gestational hypothyroidism or any other chronic illnesses were seen in second trimester. And uh, the trimester, uh, she felt, uh, her hemoglobin was around six and uh, she has been given one at uh, CHC at seven months of gestational age. And uh, her weight gain was around only five to six then. And uh, her, uh, she doesn't have any antipartan hemorrhage antenatal period. Uh, and uh, she suddenly developed a spontaneous uh, leaking of uh, amniotic fluid for which she has been done emergency LFCS at 32 weeks of gestation after eight hours of rupture of membranes. Uh, the liquor is non false smelling and uh, mother doesn't have any fever during delivery. Uh, newborn has been delivered at 32 weeks of gestation with birth weight of uh, 1.42 kg at 30 hospital Bhavanagar. The newborn steps of research station were done immediately and a patient has been admitted to NICU immediately after respiratory distress and further management. Coming to the family history. No, any chronic illnesses running in the Just family. Uh, yeah, experts. Yeah, if you have any questions on the antenatal history and birth history, you can. Okay, just can we do a brief discussion and revisit the history, Barga? Ah. Yeah. So you told this baby is a thirty-six weeks preterm. Thirty-two weeks. Thirty-two weeks. And you are examining him at twenty days. Twenty days. So what is the post-conceptional age? Do you know the idea of post-conceptional age? 35 weeks, ma'am. Yeah. So post-conceptional age is you add the postnatal day to the weeks of gestation and you mention what is the importance of knowing the post-conceptional age? Ma'am, uh, uh, post-conceptional post -conceptual age is important because uh, we, we look after weight uh, according to the weight gain and uh, uh, regarding any uh, uh, complications, everything is important uh, and we, we measure it uh, corresponding to post-conceptional uh, age, not of post-delivery age because preterm, the parts will be continuously growing and uh, some organs achieve maturity at some point of gestational age. Like uh, this patient might develop uh, sucking and uh, rooting, uh, sucking and uh, uh, swallowing coordination at 34 weeks or of it. So we can probably guess uh, when we can uh, establish the patient uh, breastfeeding and uh, spoon feeding. And uh, we will uh, uh, we can also know that uh, whether this patient is uh, going into ROP, or retinopathy of prematurity. So we can monitor him accordingly uh, as per the gestational age. And uh, post-conceptional age is uh, important in uh, knowing further management because if it is an extremely preterm or early preterm, there will be some more complications that uh, patient might be having surfactant deficiency less than 34 weeks or of age, uh, so they will mostly develop respiratory distress. So post uh, post conceptional age is uh, very much important in further period also, compared, uh, like uh, uh, monitoring the weight of the patient, monitoring the uh, uh, length, head, head circumference. 
Okay, Bhargav. So, partly you were right. Your post-conceptional age is very, very important. One, you told about the feeding cues. Like the baby may start swallowing by 31, 32 weeks of post-conceptional age. May start sucking at the breast and taking breast milk by 34 weeks of post-conceptional age. So that is one important thing. The second point you told is about the retinopathy of prematurity. Most of us also know this retinopathy of prematurity. Mostly it peaks around the 34 to 36 weeks of post-conceptional age. So you have to make sure you've examined the eyes before that. The third point I would like to tell you regarding the weight plotting is we all have two types of growth charts. One is a preterm growth chart, another one is a term growth chart. So most of the time when the post-conceptional age crosses 40 weeks, people tend to start plotting in a term growth chart. Sometimes by 46 or 50 weeks, people tend to use a term growth chart. So that is also helpful. And the last important uh, thing is the development of a child, if you are monitoring in your post after discharge in the follow-up clinic, so the developmental milestones also, we allow the baby to cross the 40 weeks of post-conceptional age and then start monitoring the development. So these four points you have to remember. The second point is regarding the causes of preterm labor. You told quite a few things on preterm labor. The metals always when you are telling the causes, you divide it into maternal cause, the placental or the cord causes, as well as the fetal cause. So you elaborated a lot on the maternal cause. Why are you worried about preterm labor? If there are no history in the mother, this mother still goes into preterm labor. Will you be worried or not? Why? Ma'am, this patient, uh, this patient's mother is having severe anemia, so she might be having a chance of uh, preterm labor. What is the implication of anemia on the baby? Will the fetus be anemic? No, ma'am. Yeah. So anemia in the mother doesn't mean anemia in the baby unless it is a separate hereditary condition. This anemia. In the mother, will affect only when the oxygen carrying capacity of the maternal blood is low and she's not able to deliver enough oxygen to the fetus. Another important uh, thing of a spontaneous preterm labor or spontaneous rupture of membrane is you are putting the baby at the risk of infection, infection. and chorioamnionitis per se may release certain enzymes like elastase and proteinases which can lyse the membrane and result in spontaneous rupture. So early on, that is spontaneous uh, rupture of membrane could also be a sign of your chorioamnionitis. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What do you mean by PROM? Uh, premature rupture of membranes, ma'am. Uh, it, uh, it is important to know whether uh, uh, pre it, it was uh, delivered immediately after rupture of membranes, that means uh, latent TV has been started of uh, amniotic fluid because uh, we should uh, be vigilant uh, regarding early onset septicemia due to chorioamnionitis, uh, newborn may land into septic, uh, septicemia. So uh, we, uh, okay. we should then be what is uh, very PROM? Premature rupture of membranes. PPROM. PP. So when it comes to rupture of membrane, there are three things you should know, Bhargav. Uh -huh. First is pre-labor rupture of membrane. You always expect the membrane to rupture after the onset of labor. If there is no labor onset, still the membrane ruptures, then you will be worried. So it could be like a chorioamnionitis or any other issue causing a pre-labor rupture of membrane. Second uh -huh. is preterm or pre rupture of membrane where the membrane rupture before the onset of 37 weeks of gestation. And the third P could still be a prolonged preterm rupture of membrane, where the duration, you are worried if it is more than 18 to 24 hours. hours, as every hour increases after 18 hours to 24 hours, the risk of early onset sepsis increases. Okay? So rupture of membrane, three things. One is whether before or onset, before or after the onset of labor, Two, in a premature or after completing full term. And three, what is the duration? Okay. So you again, you told whether it is 32 weeks and 1.42 kilo. 
What is your comment on that? Ma'am, uh, my, my patient is uh, small for gestational age. Mm. Okay. So how do you know small for gestational age? Uh, Ma'am, by plotting over the pentagon growth chart. Uh, and okay. Okay, fine. So your small for gestational age definition is what? Less than third percentile of according to the gestational age. Okay, fine. Okay. So this is definitely a small for gestational age. So what are the centile charts given in your Fenton? Uh, 3%, 50% and uh, 97%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So you plotted your weight in your Fenton chart. You have a chart with you? Ma'am, uh, I plotted and I arranged it in a tabular form, but I didn't uh, show the... Okay, so uh, finally uh, when we come to discussion, just show the chart, okay? At first, what have you plotted? Seven days, what have you plotted? 14 days, where have you plotted? 20, 21 days, where have you plotted, okay? okay. And another thing is, whenever you are doing a preterm delivery, you are attending a preterm labor and delivery, never say the routine steps of resuscitation. So what is the routine steps of resuscitation? Did you take any special precautions being a preterm baby? Ma'am, a patient has been... Uh, uh, we took a, along a... Um, we took our uh, TP resuscitator along with us uh, for uh, uh, preterm delivery, and uh, uh, we started early uh, early PEEP uh, support uh, at the labor room itself. And uh, we, as we noticed the respiratory distress there itself, and uh, shifted to NICU with uh, PEEP support, ma'am. Okay. Is it enough if you just tell the preterm resuscitator or whatever your uh, what, what did you say your TP resuscitator? What is, what is more specific about resuscitation in the labor room for a preterm baby? There are certain points, no? You know preterm is vulnerable for one, two, three, four, five. Tell me that one, two, three, four, five. And what precautions you took to prevent all this? This is simple what you do day in and day out. Okay. Yeah. So first is temperature, correct? Um, you are not audible or visible pressure, uh, Barga? We, we monitored for the quick uh, any other congenital anomalies and uh, we, uh, we checked for patient has been cried immediately you or not. Out, and you we went out for a while. Barga, Barga, you went out for a while. Just start from the beginning. You froze for a while. I couldn't hear you. Ma as soon as the uh, when we received the call itself, we started the warmer, uh, preheated the warmer, and uh, after uh, and the baby has been delivered, uh, and the patient has cried immediately at the side of the mother bedside itself, and uh, uh, it, uh, immediately we brought to the warmer, and uh, we have dried the baby, we have uh, uh, provided the warmth to the baby, and uh, uh, steps for a uh, clean cord clamping has been taken, and. Uh, Immediately wrapped the baby with the TP's resuscitator and shifted to our NSU immediately. The first temperature, did okay. you do delayed cord clamping or not? Hmm. Ma'am, delayed cord clamping is routinely done, but I didn't notice whether okay. so delayed clamping. cord clamping should have been done, correct? Uh, uh, to, yes, if the baby is otherwise stable, skin to skin contact over the mother can also be done. Okay. Okay, these two are very important. Suppose you are worried this baby is limp, blue, not crying. Then you do an immediate cord clapping and you bring the baby to the warmer, which is already switched on at least 20 minutes as per okay. the NRP. And you also make sure your labor room temperature in a preterm delivery has been around 25 to 26 degrees. Okay. So you said you immediately drive the baby. Suppose this baby has been a preterm, maybe 20, 30 weeks, 31 weeks. Would you have done anything differently to maintain the temperature? Are you aware of cling wraps being used? Uh -huh, cling wrap uh, we use in yeah. our warmers uh, in preterm. What is patient? different in warming a baby with a cling wrap or a radiant warmer? Something you don't do. Recycling of... Uh air will happen and uh, uh, radiant heat loss will be prevented in a clean wrap. Okay. 
what do you do differently you don't do something in klingra but you do something in radiant warmer what is it in the klingra you don't wipe the baby dry as soon as the baby is delivered you try to wrap not only the radiant or anything it is the evaporative water loss you know you allow the wetness to persist on the skin so that the convective heat loss is not there or the evaporative heat loss is not there convective heat loss not there because the cling wrap approximates the baby's body there is no air yes ma'am evaporative heat loss not there because you allow the moisture to be on the baby's skin and then wrap whereas in a radiant warmer to reduce the evaporative heat loss you immediately dry the baby and then put the baby on the radiant warmer so these are all the immediate steps which you adapt to prevent hypothermia and at the earliest you remove the wet linen you have to be very careful to tell this you remove the wet linen and you use another warm dry linen to cover the baby's head body as well as the limbs okay the second thing you told about is your tp is resuscitator yes very good what is the indication to use a tp is resuscitator two important points can you tell me because i want all of you to know about it i am elaborating ma'am whenever there is a uh, severe respiratory uh, whenever you we notice respiratory distress in a preterm patient uh, uh, tp is resuscitator should be used okay As what per, precaution uh, what precautions you take while using a tp is resuscitator there is something more which i want tp around 5 we put whenever you are using tp is resuscitator first baby should have spontaneous respiratory effort. spontaneous respiratory effort. without respiratory efforts i can't use just a peep two you also told the baby is breathing and baby has got respiratory distress can you tell me one or two signs of respiratory distress in a preterm baby mama uh, uh, grunting and uh, intercostal indrawing subcephalic indrawing and uh, respiratory lag as per or nasal yeah. clearing yeah so you told all this do you have any score which tells you all this a uh, silverman anderson score ma'am so you know silverman anderson score what are all the things and how to use them yes so you you find a baby to be breathing so you want to use cpap you know this baby is grunting and you put a silverman anderson score which shows retractions flaring of elanesi and grunting and you are desired to use peep one more point is fio2 okay very important you should never use a tp is resuscitator without a blender attached to it yes ma'am nrp says term newborns you can start using with 21% oxygen normally yes. if it is a preterm newborn 21 30% oxygen is good you don't start with 100 50 or So, how do you know which percentage of oxygen to start with? Ma'am, uh, SpO2 monitor. Correct. Wonderful. Where do you place the SpO2 monitor? On the right upper limb. Correct. Perfect. So you put a pre-ductal SpO2 monitor. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you put it in the right, and so you know the saturation, minute-based saturation, no? Yes, ma'am. It is sixty-five, sixty-five, seventy, seventy to seventy-five. 75 to 80 for our our comfort zone is 90 to 95 right all of us quickly want to see it in the monitor 80 to 95 so how long it takes 10 minutes 5 to 10 minutes. minutes so no need to increase your fio2 to get it earlier so we That's start right. with 21 to 30% and we titrate the fio2 based on your minute based spo2 correct so these are important things which you shouldn't forget while resuscitating a preterm and the next thing is maintaining the sugar and do not do vigorous suctioning vigorous tapping holding upside down and all that because incidence of uh-huh. ivhsi so mm-hmm. if you want to avoid ivh in this baby what are the labor room measures you have taken care of labor room one Two, three. We already discussed. Antenatal steroids are prior to delivery. That decrease. Yes. Did you tell it in your history? Ma'am, this patient was having spontaneous uh, uh, rupture membrane, so she has not been given antenatal steroids, ma'am. Okay. So no. So that is a big negative point for this baby, right? Yes, ma'am. Another thing. Anything else you should do antenatally? To get an optimal outcome. mg 
Yeah. What did you say? Potassium sulfate. Yeah. So generally, what are all the antenatal measures for a good outcome? Is one antenatal steroids. So can you elaborate? What is the ideal antenatal steroid you want for this baby? Ma'am, uh, ideal is a racemic mixture of beta metasone acetate and phosphate. But in India, it is not available, so we do dexamethasone uh, 6 mg uh, twice a day for two days. Yeah. Then immediately deliver. Immediate. So ideally, there should be this gap uh, within seven days. If the delivery took place, it is okay. But uh, after seven days, uh, even of antenatal steroid, we can, uh, if we are even expecting a high risk uh, preterm delivery, then also we can repeat another time dose. Yeah, there usually, is no point of uh, yeah. dose. The repeat course is still controversial. If you expect a delivery to happen before 32 weeks only, we consider a repeat dose after 32, after seven days. Okay, fine. Then magnesium sulfate. Okay. You don't have to tell the dose and all that. So magnesium sulfate infusion is started only if there is going to be imminent delivery. Like antenatal steroid, you can't give off magnesium sulfate, wait and these uh -huh. things to happen after a week. So. Uh -huh. The third point is in preterm pre rupture of membrane, pre-labor rupture of membrane. Antibiotics uh -huh. you can give so that you buy time to for the antenatal steroids to act and all that. And the fourth is delayed cord clamping is a very good important thing. It reduces the IVH, but milking of the cord vigorous and all that has got other impact. So we don't advocate all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you're resuscitating a preterm, you have to keep all these things into your account and don't just say I did routine. You did or not. I did all this means I wanted to do all this itself. It will tell us that you know a great deal about it. Okay. Right. Can we proceed? Somashri, anything you want to add? Yes, I have two or three questions. Uh, Dr. Bhargav, uh, uh -huh. I really wonder when you told that uh, emergency section was done when there was a spontaneous leaking TV. So uh, doesn't uh, it make it surprised? Because unless you know, you will not uh, ask your obstetricians regarding the indication. So why uh, emergency section was done here? Ma'am, so already leaking, know, is... start, leaking amniotic fluid has been started, so patient will be going into oligohydramnia. So prior to that, uh, they they done cesarean, uh, cesarean section. Okay, so I hope you know the uh, RCOG guidelines. So what does it tell that what should be the idle management of PPRM and what are the uh, you know what are the context where actually the emergency section was done because that history was missing no? in your history that's uh -huh. why i'm asking that why emergency section was done so what is the you know ideal treatment ideal management of a mother who a, who has started spontaneous leaking pv in 32 week gestation that is my question so definitely it is expectant management antibiotic and antenatal steroid so in your uh, history, you also didn't mention about antenatal steroid. And regarding the antibiotic management of the mother, so uh, can I ask you what is the you know, result of Oracle, O-R-A-C-L-E, R-C-T, related to this you know, PPRM management? No, ma'am. No, no. Okay, I think uh, you should not go in very details, but you should read the management of PPRM as per the RCOG guideline, okay? And uh, this Oracle RCT tells about the, you know, that uh, beneficial effect of broad spectrum antibiotic for preterm pre labor rupture of membrane. And it has been found that if uh, the antibiotic given for seven to 10 days, then neonatal outcome is better. Okay. okay. So uh, in my mind that that history was missing, why emergency section was done, whether there was any, uh, you know, any uh, features of fetal distress, fetal tachycardia, uterine tenderness, or mother is having some features of increased infection like high leukocytosis. You also didn't mention regarding uh, whether there is high vaginal swab was sent, cervical swab was sent, like that. And also in exam, you may be asked, although that was not present, you told, the, what are the diagnostic criteria of chorioamnonitis? So there are certain diagnostic features uh, for the presumptive chorioamnitis or clinical chorioamnitis, and there are some 
you know, criteria for confirmed diagnosis of chorioamnitis. So can you tell me what is the clinical criteria, clinical diagnostic criteria for chorioamnitis? Because unless you know, you will not ask, no? So please tell me what are the clinical know. diagnostic criteria of chorioamnitis? Foul smelling, foul smelling like a and tree. Foul smelling like that. And you are not audible, Varga. Um, ma'am, no, am I am I audible? Yes. What is the first Hello? first symptom we get whenever we have infection? Fever during labor. Yes. So it is intrapartum fever with any two of the following. So what are those? So one is malodorous vaginal discharge, you are right. And what are the others? So it is fetal tachycardia, uterine tenderness, and high leukocytosis in the mother, more than 15,000 per deal. Okay? okay. So any two of the following. If it is there, then it is clinical coroaminitis. Um, Ma'am already has mentioned uh, the beneficial effect of uh, that delayed cord clamping that you should keep in mind. So uh, even if you being a MD resident, you may not remember the actual relative risk, but you should at, le at least you should know what are the beneficial effects. So can you just elaborate what are the beneficial effect of delayed cord clamping in a preterm baby? Ma'am, delayed cord clamping uh, prevents anemia of prematurity. It uh, uh, provides adequate iron stores, so, so yes. uh, anemia can be prevented. Anything else? And uh, better transition and better prevention trans of NEC uh, and IVF. Circulation transition, it is beneficial. Yes, and prevention of NEC and IVH. Uh, so these all together. And uh, regarding antenatal steroids, so did, you didn't mention, so did the mother uh, get at least one dose of antenatal steroid here? No, ma'am. Uh, as per obstetrician, no. Patient uh, came immediately and they, uh, these people have given, uh, done emergency LSCS. So okay. no antenatal steroid has been given as per obstetrician. Okay. So uh, our country being a uh, low middle income country, so... Uh, do you know about any trial which is uh, you know very popular done by WHO research group for this beneficial effect of antenatal steroid? I have read my button. Okay, so these are action trials by action groups. So uh, what is the benefit? Why are we asking regarding the antenatal steroid? Because it uh, prevents uh, many preterm complications, uh, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, decreases IVH, uh, decreases NEC, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, and uh, uh, it has a. Uh, uh, hmm. Okay, so basically, for the low middle income country groups, which was done, so they found that it decreases neonatal mortality and also still birth without increasing any risk of maternal infection. So that is the one of the most important thing you should remember, okay? And uh, I wonder that this mother actually had a very uneventful pregnancy, but in the third trimester, the mother was very, uh, had very severe anemia, no? So and that, uh, yeah, it required transfusion also. So what do you think about it? What history did you, uh, you know, elaborate for this? Don't you think it is very, you know, uh, it is, uh, no surprising why it happened. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, she was uh, not regularly taking, uh, I think so, but she was saying that uh, she was taken, relative has told that she is taking regularly IFA supplementation. Okay, but, uh, thought, but what is the one point you will definitely ask for that is the compliance to okay. the whatever the supplements has been advised. Anything else? Diet, uh, dietary changes made. Okay, nutritional. Yes, uh, excellent. Anything else? Common infection, helminths and all, malaria, helminth, helminthic infection, and anything else? History of blood loss, like, uh, yeah, like uh, hemorrhoids and all. So history of blood loss, okay? And anything else? 
other history that ma'am was telling na the family history genetic history of any hemoglobinopathy or any chronic disease like an active tissue chronic renal disease some chronic disease whether the mother is suffering from right so mm-hmm. you have to at least one or two negative points also you have to add in the history right when right. you were telling that mother had uh, was severely anemic and that required blood transfusion you got it now okay okay you can proceed or you are doing excellently well so please proceed mm. uh, course course during uh, nso admission a uh, patient has been admitted with respiratory distress with a uh, Serum and Anderson score of six out of ten, and uh, kept over bubble CPAP cap and mask uh, with uh, P7 and uh, FO2 forty percent. And chest X-ray uh, has been done. It appeared to be the white out lung. Uh, so surfactant has been given by Inspire Technique uh, within two hours of life, and uh, continued CPAP support for four days with uh, cap and mask. And uh, we have uh, gradually weaned out of the CPAP support, uh, and the patient has been uh, shifted uh, out of uh, shifted to nasal prongs on fifth day. and uh, remote uh, oxygen support on eighth day of life and a uh, uh, patient has been uh, started a minimal enteral nutrition on a uh, uh, first day of life and gradually increased to uh, 180 ml per kg per day by 10th day of life and uh, as soon as the patient got uh, o2 weaned off uh, and we started kangaroo mother care support on eighth day and the uh, patient has got developed uh, ictus on fourth day of life with for which for phototherapy has been given for 48 hour and uh, we have started spoon feeding on 11th day of life and uh, breast feeding has been established over 18th day of life and uh, pra- when this case was examined on 20th day of life uh, the patient was being uh, monitoring for weight and uh, kmc and uh, multivitamin and calcium supplementation vitamin d3 supplementation along with the uh, HMR charge is being given. Uh, in a in a summary, uh, 20 year old, 20 day old female newborn baby born to a primary gravid mother born out of LSVS at uh, 32 weeks of gestation has been admitted for uh, severe uh, respiratory distress syndrome uh, and uh, uh, given respiratory support uh, developed ictus and neonatal hyperbilirubinemia for which uh, phototherapy has been given and has been gradually transited. from tube feeding to breast feeding with a gradual weight monitoring we just go through the neonatal problems one by one barga just for everybody's sake neonatal problems yeah just go back to the yeah so you see, you mentioned about the baby having respiratory distress and you also found the silverman anderson score to be 6 by 10 and you started the baby on bubble cpap with mask Yes, so, what is the use of bubble CPAP? What do you mean by CPAP? Continuous positive airway pressure, ma'am. Okay. Uh, it uh, pre- it uh, prevents uh, uh, alveoli from collapsing and uh, maintains ventilation perfusion. Alveoli from collapsing. Okay. Why would you want to do that? Uh, because there is the, no. When do, the, is... when do the alveoli have a tendency to collapse? when there is no surfactant uh, or low amount of surfactant okay otherwise in a normal breathing baby in a normal respiratory cycle when do the alveoli have a tendency when you are breathing in ma'am during inspiration do they collapse no ma'am uh, so expiration yes. at the end of expiration alveoli have a tendency to collapse so to prevent that collapse you are using What are you using? We are using continuous positive airway pressure. Yeah. So, what do you set in continuous positive airway pressure? We set F I O two and uh, the peak uh, peak ex- end expiratory pressure. Yes. It is a end expiratory pressure, correct? Yes, sir. So, why do you have to keep the alveoli open at the end of expiration? what it establish what are you worried huh to prevent uh, uh, to uh, to cause adequate wash of uh, co2 okay okay so what happens when the baby cries vigorously cpap support won't be adequately delivered uh, if uh, patient is crying or the baby who is spontaneously breathing coming out crying loudly yes ma'am 
Yeah. So when the baby breathes in nicely, cries, your water amniotic fluid in the lung is replaced by air. Correct? Yes, ma'am. As the alveoli open up, functional residual capacity is established. This functional residual capacity is very, very important because this alveolar interface, capillary interface is there in the lung. Mm -hmm. Your air goes through the alveoli, reaches up to the alveoli. From there, this oxygen diffuses into the capillary and from there, it goes to diffuses yeah. and goes to the lung and other thing, correct? Mm -hmm. So by giving CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, you set two things, which is positive end expiratory pressure and an FiO2. By doing this, you prevent the alveoli from collapsing at the end of expiration. Okay, And you get a good alveolar capillary interface to be open up. Another important thing is only when your FRC is good, your surfactant will be released. So by giving just a PEEP and CPAP, by giving a good FRC and opening the alveoli, whatever surfactant which is there, even less in a preterm, will start acting and reducing the surface tension. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. This surface tension, once it is reduced, again it is going to help in keeping your alveoli open. Okay? Oh, yes, so first, if the baby is breathing spontaneously, by giving a good peep, by giving a good FRC, your helping your endogenous surfactant, which is already there to act. Okay. So thereby reducing the surface tension and further improving the FRC of the lung. Okay, so that is very, very important. Chest X-ray appeared to be white out lung. Okay. So what does it mean to you? For uh, highly membrane disease as per mm -hmm. X-ray radiologically. Okay, why is it white? What can a white lung tell you? What does it mean if the lung is white? Uh, inadequate uh, uh, air, inadequate uh, air entry, air diffusion. Fine. So your alveoli are not open with air. Okay. They are collapsed and they are white and opaque. Correct. That is one point. Second point, even if it is fluid, it can be white. Fluid. Uh, yes, Correct. Yes, even if it is Blood, it can be white, pulmonary hemorrhage. Yes, so how do you differentiate? Ma'am, uh, if, uh, if it is the fluid, uh, uh, like it, uh, like in a transient acupnea of newborn, uh, there will be an outburst from the hilum and uh, it will be seen only in interfissural region only, interfissural region only. We'll Very see good. Oh, yeah. was, and even in pulmonary hemorrhage also, if we, we don't see the entire uh, complete uh, two lungs uh, uh, becoming white, uh, we will see some localized uh, hemorrhage areas. But uh, by two lungs uh, coming out to be white, uh, it is uh, mostly due to hyaline membrane disease. Okay. Third point to call it hyaline membrane disease. Very important point to differentiate from the other two also. It could also be a pleural effusion. Again, it may be white to you. You may not get the classical sunburst appearance. Anything else, when you tell the radiological features of RDS, nobody uses the terminology HMD. So now we use the criteria for RDS. First is small volume lung. If it is a GTN fluid loaded lung, your lung volume should be normal. Here the alveoli and all are collapsed, so you are getting a small volume lung. Okay. Second, you may see air bronchogram. Air bronchogram. Yeah, air bronchogram means, yeah, air is going through the bronchi, but the background alveoli are collapsed. So yes. on a white background, you see nice air bronchogram. Yes, right? Third, if it is very severe, and there is also a fluid, because this baby wouldn't have breathed well, we wouldn't have given a good peep. So then it may be a total white outlook. So that's how we grade. The milder form, very small groups of alveoli are collapsed. So you get that grainy pattern, reticulogranular pattern. Okay. RDS means one, a small volume lung. Two, it may have a reticulogranular pattern or a whiteout with a lot of air bronchogram. 
even crossing the cardiac heart uh, heart four is totally white out lung where the lungs are total okay yeah. why did you mention a 40% fao2 does your fao2 mean anything to you ma'am requirement of uh, uh, patient is get need there is need of a uh, 40% requirement uh, to maintain saturation around 92 and 95 okay fine so what does it mean to you do you take any decision based on your peep and fao2 or uh, not yes ma'am uh, surfactant should be administered uh, with... so what is the fao2 criteria you use for uh, surfactant so ma'am uh, it is a uh, uh, 40% it is a 40% in uh, cpap and uh, 30% in mechanically ventilated patient okay and what is do you have any peep criteria again how much peep do you go up to what is your starting peep ma'am uh, peep uh, peep criteria in it cloart it is mentioned around uh, at uh, uh, eight eight uh, peep then you should go for surfactant administration requirement of okay so what do you see so how do you know whether your cpap is successful or not in drawing uh, we monitor for in drawing uh, uh, intercostal in drawing and uh, sub gpad in in drawing sub costal in drawing should be decreased uh, and uh, patient should be uh, silent and uh, we auscult it for adequate delivery of uh, uh, peep throughout the lung then when if it is a uh, decrease uh, retractions are decreased or absent then we think it is sufficient peep is being delivered so you monitor yeah, again your silverman anderson score is also a good deal you monitor the work of breathing the basic idea of putting a cpap is to reduce the work of breathing yes, make sure your alveoli do not collapse so you have an fao2 criteria and you also have a peep criteria correct yes, so you also told very good your target oxygenation spo2 is this and that and you know you are also very clear with your x ray appearance of rds so with all this you decided to give a dose of surfactant what is the dose of surfactant 2.5 ml per kg for sure sir Uh, make 100 100 100 mg per kg surfactant should be given yeah because if you say 2.5 ml of curosof it contains how much almost double of what you said i think so always you tell the dose of surfactant in grams per kg of the phospholipid okay so 100 mg per kg is the standard dose yeah. though some advocate higher doses of 150 okay. okay and never tell it in ml because all different uh, surfactant have got different concentration yes, some say you give 5 ml per kilo some say you give 4 ml per kilo and some say you give 1.25 ml per kilo so always in milligram per kilo is the dose of surfactant why did you choose 100 mg per kg because uh, for a normal in, in a yes you are breaking away i am not able to hear you you are still not able to hear you you have stopped check your connection or just wait a minute see if you have to unmute ma uh, am i audible now yeah now you are audible bargam again you went back around 100 to 120 mg per kg of surfactant is there uh, in a preterm uh, it, it might be here 10 to uh, 20 to 30 also uh, we in order to yeah so generally they say in a term baby the normal surfactant pool should be around more than 100 mg per kg in the pre term it may be as low as 10 20 30 or so that's why we give a peep yes, to mobilize the endogenous what little surfactant you have you mobilize that by giving peep and just by giving this delivery room peep or cpap in the baby almost 50% of babies do not need a surfactant so that's what all the famous support point trials have shown okay so all babies who receive cpap need not receive surfactant and you have the criteria to give surfactant and the dose is 100 mg so what are the types of surfactant available any idea natural which is better ma'am natural lipid lipid extract and uh, synthetic yeah natural it is 
bovine pork and uh, pork and cura sir bovine uh, sir and uh, one and ek new yes. new sir and, you should yeah for your exams you should know all about surfactant metabolism the content phosphatidyl glycerol phosphatidyl inositol okay. the function of yes. all surfactant proteins a b c d what is recycling of surfactant what happens to the by product and how does antenatal steroids act on the surfactant and how does it improve the lung all this you have to know bargav your theory question on surfactant is for sure so you have to be very very clear in writing about a essay on surfactant metabolism okay okay so the next point uh, somashri would you like to carry on uh yes just one or two questions uh abaga uh, what the discussion was going on from there i just uh, you know mcq type of question so you told that there was a white out lung right so can you just tell me what was the grade of uh, respiratory distress syndrome as per uh, the radiology concern it's for x ray grading of white out lung what I is mean it heart uh, differentiate from heart shadow Huh? So, what is the grade? What is the grade four. of RDS? It is grade one, four. two, three, four. What? Any guess? Ma'am, grade four, I think so. Grade four. Ah, excellent. And grade three, what it would be? Ah, uh, it would be a diffuse. diffuse uh, reticular pattern with a uh, large air bronchogram yes and along with one more point that cardiac fillet cannot be appreciated separately separately yes because in grade 2 also you can have that homogeneous reticular granular pattern plus minus mm -hmm. air bronchogram so air bronchogram can also be there but the for the grade 3 the specific point is cardiac fillet cannot be appreciated okay. separately and grade 1 as ma'am said it can be only low volume uh, lung with homogeneous mild reticular granular pattern excellent so uh, can you just tell me one bedside easy test uh, which uh, can tell you regarding the surfactant deficiency bedside test bedside test uh, shaking uh... yeah shake test so sample will be obviously it is not amniotic fluid but it's done in antenatal period so it will be gastric aspirate right gastric aspirate. yeah so uh, i hope you know the what is the exact procedure how to do it okay so it is 0.5 ml of gastric aspirate with 0.5 ml of nsl you just have to mix it for 10 second and then it is 1 ml right so 0.5 ml uh, gastric aspirate plus 0.5 ml nsl is 1 ml then it has to be mixed with 1 ml of 95% ethyl alcohol right and you have to shake for 15, 15 second 10 to 15 second and you have to keep it for another 15 minutes and you have to look for the air fluid surface whether there is any bubble or not right so if there is no bubble at all so it will tell you so what will be the sensitivity and specificity that you are dealing with a case of rds so basically the positive predictive value is very high and near about you know around 100% so uh, but the sensitivity is poor the so specificity is good so sensitivity is around 70% but specificity is more than 95% so it will tell you that yes you are dealing with a case of rds right okay so uh, another thing that uh, i want to ask you that <laughs> regarding uh, uh, why uh, don't you get surprised to see it is white out lung for a 32 week and although the mother didn't get antenatal steroid i understand so what are the risk factors you uh, feel that uh, that's why the baby had severe rds so the hint is the clue is pprom so what is your inference early on coronary arteries no it was not there as per your history yes ma'am So, what do you feel if I ask you specifically that do you feel that PPROM is a risk factor for RDS or it is protective? Other way around. What is the relation with PPROM? 
and I should have put them in an RDS. In spontaneous labor, uh, RDS is low. No, reverse. In spontaneous labor, RDS chances are more. Uh, specifically related to premature rupture of membrane, what do you feel? Premature rupture of membrane. So what do you feel? More chance. Huh? So actually the, whatever evidence is there in the animal models, it has been shown that, you know, few cytokines come out, okay, after these, uh, after this uh, rupture of membrane. So there is a thought uh, initially that, uh, and also there is some, uh, you know, literature evidence that in the animal model that it is protective, it increases the surfactant production. But later, many human studies have come up which found that, the, that no, PPRM rather is a risk for surfactant deficiency. So it is actually not protective. And when there is histological choroamnonitis, means it is a proven case of choroamnonitis causing funicitis, means fetal vasculitis and fetal affection. So basically that increases the risk of further DPD also. So that is not a protective thing. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, in your, uh, you know, course, I can see uh, did, you didn't plot basically, but when I plotted, so I found that uh, we, if we use the Penton 2013 sex specific chart, that is female chart, because it's a female child, right? Mm -hmm. So I found that the weight exactly falls between 10 to 50 centiles. So it is basically appropriate for that, not SMT. So that's why it, it should be sex specific Penton chart. Okay. So that okay. is my message. And in, uh, you know, in future, whenever you will present a case, so that growth chart should be incorporated in the presentation. So okay. once you feel uh, you started antibiotic for this baby, right? So what yes, was the duration of antibiotic and what was the justification for your baby? Ma'am, uh, as, uh, as per the septic reports, the patient was showing the elevated CRP on second day of life. So we have started anti uh, antibiotic. So antibiotic was started on which day of life? Second day of life. On second day of life? Okay. So baby was symptomatic. Uh, I found that it is quite a you know uh, huge FIO2 requirement was there. Although you labeled it because of surfactant deficiency because of respiratory distress syndrome, but you started antibiotic on the day two. Okay. So what did you feel before starting of antibiotic? Because ma'am, uh, we uh, didn't find any foul smelling liquor, and uh, we didn't uh, uh, we didn't have any uh, greater than eighteen hours of uh, leaking TV history, and uh, we didn't find any uh, uh, signs okay, of early on because of on day two apply you find sepsis screen like hemogram and CRP, and also blood culture definitely. So you found that CRP is raised, right? So oh. that's why you started antibiotics. So can you just elaborate? Is it very sensitive? Test for neonatal sepsis, especially on day two, what are the causes of high CRP, especially in this case? Is it only infection or anything else can it be? High CRP on day two of life for this baby, but all can come in your mind. Is it only infection or something else it can be? So, what are the causes of high CRP in the initial 72 hours of life? That maternal is maternal infection. Huh? Maternal infections can also happen. Okay, maternal infection. Anything else? Okay, in context to this scenario, so there are many causes which can increase the CRP. Okay, so that is. You know, premature rupture of membrane per se can increase. Okay, there can be maternal stress, maternal fever, although it was not there, but I am just giving you an example. And also, this baby had surfactant deficiency. Okay, the surfactant was administered. So, these all are causes of increased CRP only. So, it is not only infection. Post surfactant, you can get a high CRP after, you know, prolonged rupture of membrane, after, you know, maternal fever. Uh, even in the case of hyaline membrane disease, so you can get it. So there are a long list of cases and initially first 72 hours, even if nothing is there, there can be physiological rise of CRP. Okay, so that's why it has high negative predictive value, but positive predictive value is very poor for 
sepsis. So that's why we wait for culture report, right? So okay. what was the culture report here? Man, Blood culture report. Going to be negative. On negative. Very good. So you you talk antibiotic after how many days? Twenty after twenty four hours on second day of life we have started, ma'am. Yeah. So after how many days antibiotic was stopped? Around uh, ten days. It uh, later developed into a uh, uh, late onset. Uh, again, persistently septic has been positive. So uh, after uh, ten days we have start around ten to twelve days we have start stopped antibiotic, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so in this regard, I think uh, you should, uh, you know, you should be very cautious regarding the antibiotic stewardship approach. So when you actually should stop, uh, you know, antibiotic. So in that case, you can have a serial CRP. So which, what you, uh, you know, may guide you regarding what is happening to that CRP, whether it is falling or increasing. And another thing, the repeat blood culture has also a value. So rather than continuing antibiotic and, uh, you know, uh, attributing every symptom of a preterm due to sepsis is not a current approach, okay? So we should be aware of antibiotic stewardship approach, okay? Okay, so what about the nutrition? So I found that this baby was started with minimal enteral nutrition and the baby was, uh, you know, fulfilled at day 10 of life, right? So yes, what was your feeding protocol? Ma'am, uh, initial... Uh... We start by uh, giving minimal enteral nutrition. If a, a newborn preterm can tolerate the feed, uh, if it is between 28 to 32 weeks, so we start on the first day of life. If a patient is not vital, hemodynamically stable, uh, we start after 48, or 24, after 48 hours uh, after patient is hemodynamically stable. And uh, we increase by 15 to 20 ml per kg uh, daily. So you increase by 15 to 20 ml per kg for this baby also? Ma'am, uh, uh, when this patient uh, developed feed intolerance, uh, uh, I mean, uh, each patient developed uh, vomiting sometimes. So we don't increase uh, feed on that day. We gradually increase. Sometimes we might, uh, some days we might keep increasing the uh, uh, feed uh, depending upon the clinical condition. Okay, yeah. okay, I understand. So in, in this case, whether mother's own milk is given or donor milk or formula? Ma'am, on first three to four days, uh, we now we are not having adequate mother milk, so we uh, have donor uh, other mother milk uh, support. And after four day of life, we got adequate mother milk, so we have given exclusively mother milk. Okay, so do you have a uh, no milk bank in your uh, no. setup? No, ma'am, we don't have milk bank, but it is on process. Uh, but uh, we have other newborns, so we give uh, we other mother milk if possible. Okay, I understand. So, uh, yeah, I understand the constraints of your setup, but if, uh, you know, being a resident, if you are asked regarding the ideal, you know, the feeding protocol, so uh, there are two or three things that are there. So first is that uh, early initiation versus late initiation. So what is your point? What is your take at that point? Early versus late initiation of feed in a preterm? Early so initiation. Early initiation versus late initiation. Early initiation should be uh, started, ma'am, uh, because it uh, prevents uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay. Actually, actually, it uh, doesn't increase the risk of NEC, but it decreases the mortality. It decreases the duration of hospital stay. So in that way, indirectly, actually beneficial for the baby without any harm or without any increased risk of NEC. Because sometimes it comes in our mind now that if we start feed early, maybe it will rather lead to feed intolerance than anything so to be worried about. So that is the thing, that is the evidence. And another thing is that how early we can build it up. So how early we can build it up means, uh, you know, how early, how fast we can increase the feed. So any trials, you know, about it, about this thing, which will give you the evidence. No, 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 I, I, trials, okay, I don't so that is called the fifth trial, SIFT, that is the speed of increasing milk feed trial. So that tell yeah. you clearly that maybe 30 ml per kg feed per day, if you increase it versus 18 ml per kg per day. So it, again, it, it will result in early initiation, early establishment of the full feed without any harm, without any harm, without any increase in the risk of anything. So definitely beneficial. 
and if we concentrate on the evidence of our country so can you remember any trial recent trial which Why was not? done so that was done by dr shushma nangia so that was exactly the trial actually it is for your baby actually it is very much you know uh, interrelated because that was a very uh, their group inclusion group was stable vlbw babies so there they found that even making the baby full feed on the day one itself so that doesn't cause any increased risk of any c or fever intolerance or increased mortality so rather it decreases the hospital stay and thereby uh actually beneficial for the babies so we should not be very worried about these things rather we should be very aggressive regarding the uh enteral nutrition and full enteral nutrition okay so just uh just one more question regarding the surfactant therapy so what are the guidelines you follow i think you uh, just uh, mentioned the uh, you know criteria what is there in ems protocol right yes ma'am we routinely follow ems protocol only ma'am Okay, so I understand. Whenever I ask the resident, the resident uh, spontaneously come up with the same answer as if they are in EMS protocol. That the things are there. It is absolutely right. You are absolutely right. But whenever we quote a reference, now it should not be any you know institution protocol. We should uh, you know read about the mother articles, the original studies from where the guidelines were built up. Right? You cannot just tell it is EMS protocol, it is PGI protocol, it is JIPMAR protocol. Right? so if you see the original articles so original studies so there are basically two types of guideline one is that ecg guidelines at european consensus guideline that were came up in 2019 so they included few prospective and retrospective studies although not rcts so there they tell it should be at least 30% or more refio2 and when the baby is on at least more than equal to 6 cpa so that is their criteria so although the aims protocol has uh, you know it is a little bit relax, uh, you know uh, relaxed criteria that it had made 40% for the uh, cpap group right so uh, the ecg criteria wow. the guidelines is there which tells you 30% so in our setup we follow that criteria that is if the requirement is fio to more than equal to 30% and cpap requirement more than equal to 6 so we a uh, follow this is a clinical guideline or clinical criteria for surfactant administration and this 30 number or 40 number from where it came up it is actually the you know the criteria fio2 criteria or fio2 cut off for the cpa failure so if we wait further 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 it may cause ultimately it may land up into cpa failure and late administration of surfactant and the complications there are so that's why we avoid that delay and at that 30% or more we can take it as a cut off okay. for the surfactant administration okay. okay so anything else uh, dr lakshmi you want to ask okay, i think most of the portion you have covered you have examination to go no so let's proceed and uh, we will see okay ma'am examination uh, we have examined the baby uh, in a A lying down position with uh, all four limbs exposed uh, in a uh, uh, with a adequate covering. Uh, patient uh, temperature appears to be normal and heart rate appears to be 148 and the respiratory rate was 44 and SpO2 was 97 on room A and uh, capillary refill time is two seconds. And uh, head to toe exam coming to head to toe examination parts. Skull and anterior frontal frontal appear normal and uh, nose, mouth and neck appear normal. Uh, trunk limbs and his genitalia appears normal. Spine and hip appears normal. All hernia orifices appear normal. And uh, coming to the anthropometry, uh, anthropometry section, as per the phantom growth chart, preterm female, uh, the patient, uh, as per according, according to the birth, uh, the patient were weight was 1.42 kg at 32 weeks of gestation, and it comes between a 10th and 50th percentile. And uh, at twentieth day of life, uh, patient gain. Has, What is your comment, Barga? What is your comment based on this anthropometry? Ma'am, uh, it the patient is a, a small for gestational age patient, and the patient is not having adequate weight gain. Okay, fine. So now you know this baby 
is not growing as expected. Extra uterine yes, growth restriction. E U G R. Extra uterine, yes, ma'am. How could you have prevented it, or what will you do to improve this, ma'am? Uh, if the patient has not been went into early onset septicemia, we could have uh, prevented uh, uh, extra uterine growth retardation and. Uh, to adequate we uh, uh, we should start early onset kangaroo mother care uh, as soon as possible so there will be adequate weight gain and uh, uh, feeding feeding also i think uh, 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 the nutrition the, the as the mother is giving breast milk since 18th day uh, and uh, spoon feeding since 10th day uh, we feel that the patient is having inadequate uh, Feed, uh, feed compliance as uh, of, of mother. So we continuously monitoring the mother and has been training the mother uh, regarding the feeding. Most of most of the times it might be due to the nutrition uh, problem, feeding problem only, ma'am. What about KMC? Um, uh, we have started KMC around the uh, mother is giving uh, mother used to give only uh, six to eight hours of KMC in spite of uh, in spite of uh, recurrent counseling. So uh, that is a uh, inadequate KMC. I am. What will be your advice? We uh, okay. we advise we advise uh, Kangaroo mother care as much as possible, as much as the relative yeah my, our mother can give. Uh, if uh, they can give around eighteen to twenty four hours, also we are uh, we we have uh, we support them. But uh, sometimes the mothers were uh, very reluctant uh, to give that much of uh, Kangaroo mother care. So was it too difficult for this baby to start KMC from at least from day two onwards? The baby was stable on CPAP as per my understanding. Yes, ma'am. In our setup, we don't start a kangaroo mother care on CPAP, ma'am. Once the patient is oxygen weaned off, then only we start kangaroo mother care. So now, why KMC studies have come where you give immediate KMC? As soon as the baby's general condition is stable, even if the baby is uh, on a ventilator or baby is on at least on non-invasive ventilation like high flow or CPAP, you can start early kangaroo care and give prolonged, not just one or two hours. Yes, ma'am. Prolonged KMC for six hours, eight hours, ten hours. Longer the duration of KMC, earlier you start KMC, better is the way. Okay. So that's uh, a yes, ma'am. We are important. aware of. Recently, we have started a uh, We are started a KMC for patients with uh, on oxygen with nasal prongs also. But uh, till now, we didn't start a patient with CPAP for KMC start. No. Whenever we are talking about EUGR and not gaining adequate weight, the That's first right. is KMC, and That's the second right. is your feeding protocol. How quickly you increase? As ma'am told, the in higher advancing the feed by 30 ml per kilo per day. You give trophic feeding for the first one day or two day. If you feel the baby is good, start advancing by 30 ml per kilo per day. There is no upper limit target, no? 150 is stopping. No, it is not like that. The baby is right. able to take adequately well. You step up to 160 ml, 170 ml, 180 ml. You increase the volume so that you fill the protein gap, no? your breast milk may not contain the protein. required 3.5 to 4.5 gram of protein a day. The yes. breast milk may not provide 120 kilocalories per kg per day for positive growth. So yes. you try to cover the gap by increasing the volume of milk. Suppose you are not able to increase the volume of milk, you still have a gap, then you go and add the fortifier. Fortifier. Yes. Fortifier is not a must, I should say. As long as you are able to cover the energy gap and the protein with increasing the volume of milk, you don't have to worry about fortification of that. And the we other important thing... Of, we, we usually put a cutoff of 180 ml per kg. Uh... Yeah. The other thing you have to look is, is there a cold stress? Is the baby adequately covered? So even small things like that will put an end to your weight gain. Is there an anemia which you are not attending to? Okay. In a smaller baby, is the catabolic rate very high? Is the baby has got a CLD, oxygen dependent state, or sepsis, where even despite adequate calorie, you and developmentally supportive care. Is your baby thrashing around? You are not properly grooming the baby. 
you nicely cocoon the baby you swaddle the baby uh, you protect the baby so all this really matters when you land up with an anthropometry like this at 20th days of life yes, to make sure your baby is gaining it's just fluid calories proteins temperature and developmentally supportive care is very very important bargo mm -hmm. i want you to go and read all about developmentally supportive care and how helpful it is in preventing this eugr in all these babies who are nurtured all of us worry about ventilation the life starts after ventilation the nutrition of the dsc and kangaroo care is the most important points for taking care of a preterm baby That's and one more should... thing yeah one more thing is family integrated care so unless you involve the family unless you talk to them involve in the patient care So it may happen that even if you are telling hundred times that you increase the KMC duration, increase the KMC duration, mother is not turning up, right? So okay. that is the thing that family integrated care we should not forget about. Prashant is waiting to wake up. <laughs> Arjun, you have any questions to ask? No, ma'am. actually ma'am this discussion is going so well that we never realized that we cross the limit usually we uh, i mean finish in one hour but still now i mean there are so many questions which are pending but it was really a very good discussion and i'm uh, hoping that all the pgs who are watching this all are the basic questions which are going to be asked in the exam as well as they are useful in day to day practice also i mean if you follow all these advices then there will be a better neonatal outcome so this is the aim of our neonatal patshala and i'm glad that in the last we are having i just want to add one point for the you know ugs that 2022 who recommendation for the preterm care guideline has come up now so they should actually go through because there are different you know scopes uh, you know preventive approach so what should be done as a treatment approach and also family so these three parts are there and uh, i think for a resident they should go through it It's a beautiful recommendation, two thousand twenty-two WHO preterm guidelines. Definitely, we'll share with them. I mean, all the guidelines. Yeah, you can continue for five more minutes. Not an issue. I mean, complete it. It's going very well. So, two three things when you examine a preterm neonate barga. So, apart from the anthropometry, you should tell at what centile the weight, head circumference, and length is. No. when you look at the growth rate you expect these babies to grow by at least 20 g weight gain a day wow yes ma'am 20 to 30 you have to monitor your daily weight gain your mm -hmm. head circumference should grow at least by 0.9 to 1 cm every week mm -hmm. yes, and your length should grow by at least 1 cm every week so whenever you are monitoring you don't wait for 3 weeks to know that this baby has got ugr within a few days it's an you can know and you can go through the points which we told temperature anemia infection volume of milk calorie gap and all that what is it so we give more importance to not to the weight but to the head circumference and the length because these are the lean body mass weight which is very very important for your long term outcome not just loading them with calorie and getting a very chubby baby with adequate weight okay so that is important so apart from the anthropometry examination is very very important you have to look for inguinal hernia which is common in a preterm baby you have to look at the genitalia for some hydrocele which is again can be okay and when you examine the tone of a preterm baby you very well know they are all hypotonic the tone progress cephalocardial progression the tone it may say take some time so all preterm babies are somewhat hypotonic so you should know how to do your score new ballard score and how to do what are the physical criteria and what are all the neurological criteria again when you are doing the reflexes you should know that it is not going to be very complete it depends on your post conceptional age and area of maturation okay the ideal time to do your gestational age scoring is after 24 48 hours within 9 to 6 hours to 5 days So you can't do a baby with all the scoring, blah blah, within the first day, or oh, I forgot. By the time of discharge, you should know. You should because the physical criteria keep changing. 
as the post conceptional age increases also your tone and other things keep changing okay. Okay. and you should also look for the normal physiological parameters whenever you are examining a newborn like a mastitis a natal tooth a genitalia having an inguinal hernia and your physical examination should also include soft systolic blowing murmur which may not mean anything which may be a ductus arteriosus also okay so your thing should be totally complete your anthropometry your gestational age assessment and post conceptional age your general examination head to toe examination your then your neurological examination your systemic examination and in your neurological examination your tone active passive i think that prashant itself is a class it will be very useful for them just to teach them neonatal examination how different in a term in a preterm and how it evolves over days as a post conceptional okay barga keep these things in your mind you did very well thank you ma'am uh, so thank you so much to both our experts as well as the presenter i mean this was a really a wonderful discussion as a token of appreciation from uh, nnf gujarat uh, we want to present a certificate to dr bhargav for presenting a case in neonatal partial it is a presidential action plan of 2022 of nnf gujarat state chapter also we appreciate dr chandan narwani for mentoring him and we are very much thankful to dr v lakshmi and dr somashri rai both of them have done an actually a wonderful job i mean uh, many of the questions were such that uh, students must have learned many new things and as dr uh, v lakshmi ma'am said uh, neonatal examination yes we will be having a some more discussion on the same in next year but uh, this and our this year's uh, neonatal partial this was 37th neonatal partial of the year so thank you so much to everybody for watching and uh, the link i mean is there on the clearnet platform as well as if you want to see the recording the recording will be available on the youtube forever so thank you so much we'll be meeting in the next year with new plans and new neonatal partial part 2 thank you so much thank you thank you prashant thank you for the opportunity we enjoyed it as much thanks so much shri meet thank you, you thank you all yeah, yeah. happy new year in advance bye bye you happy new year to you all thank you we may leave yeah